there we go. Thank you very much and good morning. My eyes were opened to this field of women, peace, and security six years ago when I attended a military joint women's leadership symposium and listened to the ambassador at large for global women's issues share a story about the critical role of Haitian women during humanitarian assistance efforts following the 2010 Haiti earthquake. I remember learning that if relief workers excluded women and only gave the men food and first aid items intended to be on behalf of the entire family, the men, in the men tended to hoard the items for themselves and not share with the family. When women were included in the process, children no longer starved or needlessly suffered from injuries and the entire family prospered. That message was so powerful to me that I immediately became perceptive to watching and learning more about how everyone, families, communities, workplaces, and countries can benefit from women's involvement. Shortly after that conference, I moved to Washington, D.C. and became the aide for a three-star female admiral. If my eyes weren't already opened to gender-related issues, both from my own personal experiences and from discussions at female leadership conferences, then they were definitely opened in that job. Having the experience of being a female aide to a female admiral prompted me to research and explore the topic I'm going to share with you today, the unconscious gender bias. Prior to that job, I hadn't been aware of the prevalence of unconscious, hidden, implicit thoughts and actions against females. Like when I'd call a hotel to make lodging reservations for my admiral, and the receptionist would ask for his name. And I realized the same concept applies in the corporate world with people associating the male gender to titles such as boss, doctor, CEO. Or like when I would see sailors not giving my admiral the same military courtesies and respect that they would afford male admirals, like not addressing her as ma'am, but yet addressing a male admiral as sir. But before I continue with more specific examples of this unconscious behavior, let me set the foundation for my remarks. Both corporate America and the military have realized that diversity is a defining attribute of a, of a successful organization, and that what began as an ethical effort to curb discrimination has led to a key talent management tool which allows businesses to flourish. Organizations across all domains have reshaped, redefined, and published diversity policies to set the tone and advance the belief that creating diverse, inclusive environments is critical to mission success and organizational growth. In fact, just two weeks ago, Admiral Harley, the president of the Naval War College, promulgated his diversity way ahead, communicating that a more diverse and robust workforce whose academic rigor, intellectual capacity, and broad experience base will challenge our students to enhance their critical thinking skills and expand their perspectives. I submit, however, that despite best efforts, there's still a barrier to achieving full diversity efforts, especially in gender. And this is the unconscious gender bias, which causes people to inadvertently favor one demographic, males in this case, over another demographic, females. Moving the WPS agenda forward in the next decade, it's a strategic imperative for leaders, both civilian and military, to confront this unconscious gender bias barrier in order to maintain a high quality, diverse workforce where women can thrive and maximize their full potential. Today, I will quickly explain the psychology behind the unconscious gender bias and describe their consequences and limitations, and then I'll more fully offer effective resolutions to the problem. To begin with the psychology behind the unconscious gender bias, even though it's a relatively new concept to me, it goes back to ancient times. So unconscious biases are rooted in our brains as a safety mechanism for humans because in ancient times, beings who were different than humans were perceived as dangerous. The biases are inherent and ingrained patterns of brain activity, 
which prompt our brains to assign tags or characteristics to certain identity groups. So, for example, a tag of good or bad may be assigned to an identity group different than the human being, or lazy or productive, or intelligent or foolish, and so on. In ancient times, fight or flight from a diverse being was a matter of life or death. Now, though, we know that diversity is not a matter of life or death. Conversely, it's a matter of a company or an organization achieving its goals and reaching success. Next, I'll move on to consequences and consequences of and limitations from the unconscious gender bias. In general, biases could cause female employees to underperform, which negatively impacts the entire organization. This can be seen in an economic implication. A 2015 McKinsey Global Institute report contends that 12 trillion could be added to the GDP by 2025 by advancing women workforce equality. The unconscious gender bias serves to stimulate the best efforts of diversity policies. For example, leaders may tend to incorrectly and unconsciously assume that men welcome challenges more than women do. So leaders may develop careers of men more than they do of their female employees. Females sometimes need to display that they want a challenge. They have to ask for more jobs or tasks or more challenging assignments. Or if they choose not to ask, then they remain stagnant in their opportunity and they don't grow as an individual and nor do they contribute fully to the organization. Another limitation of unconscious gender biases is a lack of females in top leadership, leadership positions. A June 2017 study reports that only 6.4% of Fortune 500 companies had a female CEO in 2016. Military statistics are similar. A May 2017 study shows that every service organization has 10% or less female representation in flag and general officer wardrobes. This becomes a self-perpetuating problem because females tend to not see other females in top leadership positions and then they thus don't see how they could fit into that organization and they may assume that climbing the corporate or military ladder is not a viable option for them and they exit the organization. Overall, an unwillingness to challenge practices and procedures that no longer optimize the company's goals will not allow diversity to produce options for new solutions and for new growth. But I have good news. So unconscious biases can be unlearned through recognizing what they are, through their existence, and through understanding this process and this theory. We can halt our brains from processing in this way. Training and education is always a great first step. One example that I have from a recent classroom setting is one of my Air Force colleagues, one of my Air Force male colleagues in passing, made a comment about a Commodore who wanted to go fly with his boys. And I just interjected, hey, aren't there any female pilots that the Commodore is in charge of? And I tried to do it in a non-threatening way. Um, and he seemed to react well. And so if we are able to challenge events like this when, when they happen, whether it's in a corporate setting or a military setting, then it can educate everybody in the room. In response to the December 2015 Department of Defense decision to allow women to serve in all military roles, the Marine Corps has actively started training their Marines on the unconscious gender bias. They dispatch training teams to all their commands to go over these concepts. The other services can follow suit. Leadership buy-in and open dialogue between upper-level management and leadership and members of 
the demographic is very important also. Social media and networking groups, such as Facebook groups. I belong to a female Navy officer Facebook group. That's a great solution to this problem also. An example that I saw from the female Navy officer Facebook group has to do with uniforms. And I've shared this example with some other colleagues of mine, and I feel like it's a very impactful example. So the Facebook group brought up the fact that if you walk into a uniform shop, typically the uniform shop displays two models, two mannequins. And typically there's a male uniform on one mannequin and a female uniform on another mannequin. Typically, and anecdotally, of course, the male mannequin tends to be wearing a uniform of a higher rank than the female mannequin. And or the male mannequin tends to have several more ribbons and medals than the uniform of the female mannequin. I sincerely don't believe that the worker at the uniform store has consciously decided to make the male mannequin an admiral and the female mannequin a chief. Unconsciously, people assume males achieve a higher rank and achieve more medals and ribbons. Another solution is that leadership needs to view qualities as gender, gender neutral. There was a catalyst study called the Double Bind Dilemma for Women in Leadership, Damned If You Do, Doomed If You Don't, that explains how men are viewed to have leadership qualities seen as taking charge, and women are viewed to have leadership qualities seen as taking care. The double uh, bind, the dilemma comes into play that when women do display the desired qualities of taking charge, such as delegating, influencing, problem solving, then they're viewed and penalized as being too masculine. So they're either viewed as being too soft and incompetent, or too masculine and unlikable. They're rarely seen as the ideal of being both competent and likable. Another solution is to neutralize human resource processes, such as hiring, promoting, interviewing, and making these processes gender blind. You may have heard of the study that illustrated how gender blind additions helped an orchestra overcome the unconscious gender bias. The blind additions accounted for a 50% increase in the likelihood of a female advancing out of the preliminary round. And of course, promoting mentorship is always a great solution. Both, it's important to have both males and females to mentor junior employees and organizations. Some may argue that there's a challenge to this, that we don't want to disempower men. We don't want to have the male employees feeling excluded or marginalized. However, leaders need to stress that diversity is about inclusion and integration and bringing together both genders to form a better organization for everyone's benefit. In conclusion, leaders need to take this theory and translate it to action in order for organizations to function at their peak and capitalize on increased and sustainable results. Leaders can break the barriers and instill improvements to the workplace by the development, retention, and advancement of women. Finally, organizations will prosper in ways never thought possible through enriched creativity, innovation, and teamwork that diversity brings to the organization. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you to Mary and the Naval War College and to also our partner, Peace is Loud, um, for being able to come together and think about um, piggybacking actually off of the Women, Peace and Security Annual Conference to do a consortium that we did yesterday, bringing together a few um, people from across different sectors to talk about women, peace, and security curriculum and higher education and training um, and to think about the future of the field, basically. 
Um, and I'm going to just say from the outset, it was the first time that we've ever done anything like this, and I'm uh, responsible for reflecting back to you the work of the entire group. So I'm going to apologize in advance if I missed a nuance or an important point and ask my colleagues who were a part of the discussion yesterday to jump in and correct me um, where I'm leading you astray. Um, the reason why we wanted to focus on looking at curriculum uh, in education, higher, uh, higher education and training, professional training on women, peace and security is because our organizations realized through uh, many different consultations and conversations that there were a couple of things emerging in the field right now. One is that there are an increasing number of education and training uh, programs and resources that are happening all over the place, but we're quite disconnected from each other and there's a lack of information sharing due to silos in our own sectors and time and lack of resources to come together and, and share our work and, and discuss with each other. And secondly, there is also an increasing demand, both by students at all levels who are interested in this content and who see themselves having a future career in this field, and also an increasing buy-in from faculty members who are seeing the importance of talking about the issues um, under the umbrella of working peace and security within their content of whatever courses that they're uh, teaching. In fact, we found it was quite multidisciplinary, the, the interest um, from faculty members. So we thought this was really an opportune time to bring together people from academia, from military, people who are practitioners, people who are scholars, to share what they've been doing and just begin a conversation about how we are talking about women, peace, and security in the classroom and how we're training our future leaders. Um, and this very much fits with the theme of this year's conference of amplifying the women, peace, and security agenda for the next decade. And I'm just going to take a minute to step back and tell you personal uh, story or anecdote which I shared with the group yesterday when we started because um, this is in a bit of a contrast to the perspective that uh, Rosa Brooks presented to us this morning. Um, we went around the room in the beginning and we were asked to give one word about how we felt you know, before starting the conversation and a lot of people said curious and, and grateful and sometimes a little frustrated with the way things are and sometimes uh, very um, excited to um, be in the same room and finally start the conversation. And I cheated a little bit because I had two words actually. It's one phrase. Um, because recently, uh, in last year, I moved to Colorado and I've been exposed to many uh, outdoor activities there and I've noticed there's a preponderance of professional athletes that do a lot of cycling and Ultraman races and things like that. So I was very curious about this phenomenon and I started reading about it and I learned this term called draft legal. And I don't know if there's any cyclists or racers in the uh, audience, but I learned that this term when I read it, of course because everything in my mind connects to women, peace and security, why, why wouldn't it? Right. Draft legal, um, the term is when uh, cyclists are riding uh, together and um, their momentum increases because the front riders are cycling fast enough that they create a wind pocket and all the other people who are cycling in the same direction can get into that wind pocket, they ride together and in fact their momentum increases and their speed increases. And I felt like when I read that I was like, hey, that's what we're doing. That's where we are. We are all working together for many years and continuing into the future, picking up the momentum um, with each other's work in all of these different fields. And so I still feel um, very inspired and encouraged by the work that we're all doing, but I think the advantage of conferences like this and the consortium we did yesterday is to bring people together outside of their silos and to really recognize where we really are in the field and how much we have advanced, but to also combine our energies together and find those synergies and alignments and those places where we also disagree and diverge. 
um, so that we can actually pick up the momentum and really advance this agenda forward. So given that backdrop, um, the questions that we asked ourselves and really set the day for exploring were three. We asked ourselves, what is the current state of women, peace, and security education and training? What resources, what examples can we share from our own work? And what is our current work looking like? Um, what is the current state of women, peace, and, I'm sorry, what, what kind of um, community of practice can we build or even strengthen with, within this group? And third, how can the women, peace, and security, or sorry, how can women, peace, and security and gender analysis be incorporated into other fields of study versus having a separate um, women, peace, and security course so that we can reach more people with this agenda and content. And so we had a very rich and wide-ranging discussion, and many issues and, and many topics and a lot of work was shared across institutions um, and across sectors. And what was very interesting in my perspective was that the experience in the civilian academy is mirroring the experience in the military education um, sector and it's also mirroring what's happening in the policy field among practitioners. And so we found about four places where we felt there were both challenges, but those challenges represented real opportunities for us to set priorities um, to actually take action and move the field forward. So the first one, and this is not necessarily in order of priority, but um, taken as a, a whole, right? So we recognize we have an opportunity to create and strengthen a network that can bridge across disciplines and across schools and sort of uh, create a professionalization of the field through strengthening a network of a community of practice. A couple of recommendations we had collectively among ourselves was, hey, your institution did a mapping exercise. Your institution did a mapping exercise of the field and of uh, strategies or curriculum. What if we did this collectively? We could start by mapping the field collectively and taking an inventory of strategies mm -hmm. that have really worked in different institutions to create a culture more, that's more open to teaching women peace and security. Um, and more open to including gender analysis in a broad range of courses. Second, we recognized um, the growing demand for this content. And as I said at the beginning, that, that is something we already knew in the conversation. But we also talked about a little bit about the reasons for the demand um, in this content. Why is there an increase? And one is the prevailing political landscape right now, which has presented new opportunities and new interests in this field. The other is that there are actually an increasing number of jobs in the policy world and in government that are requiring the skill of gender analysis and some knowledge of women, peace, and security, which is unlike what's what happened in, in the past, even a few years ago. So we recognize as a recommendation that there's an opportunity for institutions to develop their own competitive advantage and look at the market, do a market analysis basically of what are the jobs that are coming up in the field in the future and what are the skill sets that the students really need to have to match that. And it went beyond just training in terms of skill set. It really is about shifting mindsets. I think as Nela um, used that term in terms of broadening the lens of what is security and answering the question of why are we teaching women peace and security? What is the point of this? And many of the, um, the strongest points I think Rosa Brooks um, brought up this morning is because we want to succeed in the human world a more peaceful place and have real impact in real people's lives on the ground. Third, we recognized um, the need for discussing and perhaps agreeing at a minimum to a minimum core competency in women, peace, and security if there was going to be any credible um, course or education or training uh, given on women, peace, and security, what would it have to at minimum have? And I'm going to go back to 
that point um, later because we did find some agreement, which I thought was a huge victory considering we had many different institutions represented and many different points of view represented yesterday among the 25 of us. Um, we, fourth, we recognized the opportunity to use multiple narratives and entry points to raising the topic of women, peace, and security and to getting more buy-in from different sectors. Um, we talked about shifting from advocating uh, gender-specific courses to actually integrating into other existing courses on uh, national security or IR theory or hard security, uh, hard security, right? And then we also, there was also quite an a interesting discussion about um, engaging broader audiences using gender um, analysis as a power lens or a power framework and from that position talking about masculinities and femininities and the role of masculinity and femininity in conflict and in peacemaking as an entry point. Um, and then finally I will say that as a fifth uh, opportunity or challenge that we saw, we recognized that there's a real need to connect um, women, peace, and security domestically. Um, we have, in the U.S. at least, have been very outwardly focused in the international arena, but there's a real opportunity to capitalize on a domestic connection, what's happening locally to international agendas, and to look at this through a more transnational lens. So um, the second part of our conversation was actually started to become focused more on let's talk about what teaching women peace and security really would look like. What is the minimum core competency for any sector, really, whether you're teaching a college student, a graduate student, or the soldier that's going to go out into Afghanistan. What do they at the minimum need to know? And again, we had a very rich discussion, very far-ranging topics, but it was very interesting to me that this group um, was able to agree on a set of three to four basic things that we expect to see in a Women, Peace, and Security course of training. And those things were, at a minimum, the person needs to understand what is gender, the terminology, where that, that's a starting point. Two, and this was universal among the whole group, everyone who goes through any kind of education and training program on women, peace, and security needs to know how to do gender analysis, what it is, and how to actually apply it. And that actually had universal agreement in the room. Um, third, we had a lot of discussion about where does the women, peace, and security policy framework discussion come into this. Is that a core competency? And we agreed that knowing about the women, peace, and security policy framework, the resolutions, national action plans, things like that was very important. But equally important was having a basic history and understanding of where this agenda emerged from, why it emerged, that it actually is a social, tied to a social movement and political project of gender equality was equally important content um, for people to know at a minimum and to inform their work. And then fourthly, we had a lot of discussion about um, this principle in Women, Peace, and Security of consultation with women and the inclusion of women's voices and perspectives in a meaningful way. And we did feel that that was very much part of a core competency. Anyone walking out of a training should understand that women's voices need to be included in terms of participation and informing decision making, right? But there were definitely, um, definitely a range of other topics and a range of, of other issues that belong in this mix, in this soup, and I, I want to mention a couple of them. Um, and I think, I, you know, my colleagues who were there yesterday, please jump in with others if I if I've missed out on anything. Um, but we talked about using a trans transnational lens in courses, 
forces and connecting uh, U.S. domestic movements to women, peace, and security internationally. We talked a lot about how can, in, in these courses, um, we talk about broaden, broadening the lens of what security means um, and shifting the perspective on what security means. One more minute. Okay. And then, um, just real quick, the listening to movements. This is another point with listening to movements and movement builders that aren't squarely in women, peace, and security, um, the, the, that agenda. So just, just to conclude, um, basically, we are really looking forward to continuing this conversation in the future with the group that we started yesterday and expanding it out to others that were not able to participate yesterday or, um, you know, we were limited by time and resources in terms of how many people we could bring into the conversation for yesterday, but we're very interested in, in continuing that engagement. And we did talk about community of practice and how important that was, that is to this, um, to the future of the field. And so we left on the table a discussion of, would it be something that people in this room would be interested in convening again next year in this professional network to develop, continue developing and sharing our work. Um, and so I welcome you, and I'm sure Jane and Mary as well welcome you to talk to us offline um, about continuing the conversation. Would that, would an annual meeting be of interest to everyone? Would we like to expand the group? Um, and also capturing the challenges and opportunities that we're facing um, right now in terms of developing the field. Because as I said in the beginning, I think everyone recognizes this is a real window of opportunity for us and that we're just getting started and we're building the momentum and we want to um, really put our heads down and focus and, and move uh, very fast and forward. In the, in the field. So I'm um, happy to take any questions afterwards. And thank you very much. Thank you. Hello there at the War College. She's the first student we've had represented on a panel. She is a Navy helicopter pilot, so I think it made her stories. You may not know that about her. And her, her paper um, was asked for by the Chief of Naval Operations. So I'm really pleased to hear, um, you know, it shows a little bit of how it's starting to get implemented within our student body. So Lena, thank you very much. All of you were fantastic, but it's a war college thing and I need to say that. <laughs> <laughs> thank right. you. Please, yes. Sorry, my question is, what is And I do know that a lot of 
um, my classmates here at the War College have seemed very receptive to learning about it. People that knew that I wrote the paper but that didn't have to ask to read it have asked me to send it to them. And um, people that are going, my colleagues who are going into leadership positions have asked, hey, what can I do when I'm in command to not fall prey to these concepts? But I, have, I haven't, I can't answer your question directly, I'm sorry. I have two questions, one for Rachel and one for Sahana. So Rachel, you have a lot of military advisors that are out there doing missions. How do they work with the NGOs that are out there doing a lot of the same great work as far as dividing the roles and responsibilities within the city area? The work you all did yesterday sounds great. You did a, a, a lot of work for one day. And I'm just wondering how, um, did you get a chance to talk about how you're going to execute plan as far as implementing these core curriculum within particularly the military institutions and maybe that's going to be what you talk about in the next work that we do. So just interested in your thoughts on what you talked about as far as what you know. Um, thank you. So I guess I have maybe a two or three part answer to your question. Um, to answer directly, we yesterday was the first time we ever brought people together that we ever had that kind of conversation um, to answer Rachel's question about how do we choose people. It was really who have we in our universe and three partners have we been talking to or that we know about who might be interested in joining this conversation and treating it like as it is an ex exploratory first step in sharing the work that we're doing. Um, and it's the beginning of a process and planting seeds. And I do agree, I was quite impressed with the courage and the uh, commitment of the group yesterday to actually do so much work and actually come to agreement on some things. Because usually you can sit in a room for 10 days and, and have so many different uh, perspectives and from so many different sectors and walk out with nothing and or except for frustration, right? But I was quite impressed with that. Um, in terms of implementation, I think you know that's that's on the table because, or I mean, it's still up for discussion because that was our first conversation, and I think what I've seen from that conversation, and other conversations like it, and other gatherings like this, is that there is a real hunger for the unity that Rachel, you were talking about. There's a real hunger for conversation and for sharing of information and a real acknowledgement that we aren't going to accomplish anything in our silos anymore. Like, it's not, we can, we could probably keep going along the way that we're going along, but really the collective brain power and the collective work of, of this group and, and all our other colleagues around the world is gonna have a much greater impact. And that's why I say I have sort of a two-part answer because the, that was to answer your question directly, but also in the bigger strategic vision of women, peace, and security, we talked a lot yesterday about what is this agenda? It really is about, it's a transformative agenda. Gender equality, it, you can't limit it to just, yes, that's why having numbers is so important because even that little step transforms the environment that you're in and transforms the lens through which you're looking at security. And so I would say, this is my own view and perspective, and, um, and you know, I've been accused of being the person that sees the glass um, actually overflowing and never empty, <laughs> um, is I, I believe that we collectively, everyone in this room and every, every one of our colleagues around the world who are working on women, peace, and security, in whatever sector they're in, we are in a state of great ambiguity because we're in a state of great creative chaos. We're in a creative process of evolving, and I would say it's not just evolution, but it's revolution. And we, and, it, and what really, the, the, actually the call for unity from so many different sectors and different people to me is quite interesting because it shows to me this is a, an organic movement. We often talk about we need top-down and bottom-up um, pressures to change things, but the conversation is, itself has started to shift to where is our unity of vision? Where is our unity of effort? How can we share more? How can we collaborate more? How can we get more on the same page? And so my interest, and, and I think our, my partner's interest in doing the 
conversation yesterday was to say, okay, let's let's take some of that energy and let's see what we can do. Let's just plant the seed. And now I think it's up to all of us to say we want to continue the conversation. And we may not be sure about what that's going to look like, but let's try it. Let's just try it because that's the state we're in. Women, Peace, and Security didn't come about with people saying we're going to strategize, we're going to have this network, and we're going to do it this way or that way. It came about because these women in these conflict zones were all facing the same issues and were saying, this doesn't work anymore. We need to change it. And it was, I think, through their courageous action and vision that they were able to say, we don't know what that's going to look like, but we have some ideas about what we want to see change. We have some strategies we want to try to push that forward. And because they did that, we're all here today. So I think like we can pick that ball up and we can say and admit to ourselves, yeah, we're in a state of ambiguity, but we're doing it. We're doing the work and we can do it better if we did it together. So um, I know that doesn't answer your question about well, what's, what's next, what's the implementation, but this is also a question we had in the very beginning of doing this. What is the outcome? of this. Do we need to have like a concrete action outcome? Does it have to be very specific? But I think what I learned yesterday from my colleagues is that um, just the fact that we started having the conversation, we could reach some agreement on some things and also agree that we want to further um, the conversation and professionalizing the field and perhaps having a network and how do we extend that to other people. That in itself is, is an outcome and I think a very positive. Thank you.